joining us online, welcome. I invite you to send your blue friendship books down, put your name, other information there, and then send them to the center if you would. We have a number of announcements. Please notice classes today, new member class here, joining Jesus on his mission upstairs with Pastor John. Uh, don't miss that. It's very, very good stuff. Also, men's support group this Thursday. Please notice the details. Jacob. Well, good morning. I was telling my family yesterday, I think only in Colorado can I get a sunburn from hiking with shorts and a short sleeve shirt, and the next day everyone needs to show up. So, it was about 16 inches about where I was. That was, that was a lot. As Pastor uh, had said, we have a number of announcements. Go ahead and, and look that over. As he also said, uh, Thursday, May 26, we have our men's support group. If you're a guy and you have struggles, this group might be for you. So we're kind of designing that as something where we can just chat, where we can just kind of touch base, uh, have a platform for our struggles or our needs, if you'd like that. And then in the middle page of your announcement uh, insert, uh, we have some information about VBS. Uh, so there's uh, registration is open, there's registration packets in the fellowship hall. Invite your family, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite strangers at Walmart. We don't care. Uh, registration is free and then that evening at the very bottom of that announcement page we also have uh, what's called night camp and that's for the middle schoolers and high schoolers as well and so this is an open event open group so invite your friends out to that it's always a lot of fun and then if you have any questions in regards to youth family or education you can also see me after service as well thank you thank you Jacob on that announcement page notice a grief group mentioning every or meeting every Wednesday details there mom's group please notice details and then um, summer worship schedule is there as you open your insert up on the right bottom please notice when all those change and then on the back we have our sermon hymn which will be listed insert ah and did you know we had a garage sale this last weekend? <laughs> Therefore, the garage sale is still up and it's in the choir area of the fellowship hall. Uh, all proceeds go to the playground. So uh, check out, you may find some treasures there. I invite you to turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 94, for the brief order of confession. Please stand and face the baptismal font. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you all the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The prayer of the day is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. O God, 
from whom all good things come. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to think those things which are right, and by your goodness, help us to do them. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite the children to come forward. Good morning. I think most of our students are still shoveling this morning. So typically I like to bring up something that symbolizes my children's message. But today I want to talk about fear, and I had very little desire to bring up a jar of spiders. I think they just have too many legs, Brian. I think that's what it is. When I was really young, what do you think I did when I saw something I was afraid of? Who do you think I ran to? My, my mom or my dad, very good. And so it was either my mom, my dad, my teacher, maybe my grandparents, it kind of depends where I was. And sometimes they would usher the spider back into the wild, and other times they sent the rest of the spiders a message. Squished them and got rid of them, right? As I got older, approaching your age, I worried much less about things like spiders and snakes. Still a little bit snakes, right? But I worried about things like maybe what other people thought of me. I worried about, you know, are they going to make fun of me for my new shoes, or am I going to be made fun of this? When I stepped up to the batter's box when I played baseball, what am I going to do when everyone is looking at me? I don't want to let my team down, I don't want to let my family down, I don't want to let myself down. So I realized if it was something tangible, if it was like monsters that I was afraid of, I would go to my dad. If it was that I was nervous or I had emotions that I was trying to work through, who do you think I went to? <laughs> yeah, my mom. Very good. <clears throat> she showed me that fear <clears throat> is not always bad. Sometimes fear is actually good. But she helped me and prepared my fear and tried to get me to see it maybe more as like excitement or something like that. When I was young, I learned that I could go to people who I love and who loved about me with my fears. <clears throat> and I also realized that I could always, always go to the Lord in prayer, and just being with him, and being in fellowship with other believers. I'm pretty sure some of the strongest prayers that I prayed were, Dear Lord, please help me not to look stupid in front of my friends. <laughs> Let's be honest, have any of us prayed that prayer? Yeah, exactly. So Brian, and for the rest of us, whatever we go through in our days and in our lives, it's important to have people that we trust. Fellowship with like-minded believers that we can be real with, and also to know that at any time, for whatever reason, we can go to the Lord in prayer. Not only does he care about us, but he listens to us as well. Let's do that now. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for mom and for dad. Thank you for grandpa and grandma and teachers. And all those people who will be willing to get rid of the spiders in our lives. All the scary things. But Lord, we thank you most for Jesus. We thank you for listening to us and for hearing our prayer. Be with us this week. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. The first lesson is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river 
where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The second lesson is from the Revelation to John, from chapters 21 and 22. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either, on either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. <laughs> we go, you have the words of eternal life. Hear the gospel according, uh, according to St. John chapter 14. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Be to God. Please be seated. Home, as you well know, is not simply a house. Because if you are in that house alone 
for a great period of time, you begin to realize that home is actually the people in the house. Jesus today says, my father will love them and we will come and make our home with them. Or in the Psalm 90, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling. You have been our home. You have been our home in all generations. Today we look at our ultimate home, which is the Lord God himself. And the story of how humanity were with him and then haven't been with him and then the whole long road home that he brings us back to himself. I want to look at this specific tree we hear about in the second uh, reading, the tree of life. Oh, come and gather beneath the tree of life, we will say at the end, and we will sing. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. When do we hear about this tree? It's two places. One, in the very, very beginning of the, God, of, uh, the Bible itself, Genesis. And then the other, at the very end of the Bible, Revelation. Genesis and Revelation, the beginning and the end of the Bible, it's like bookends, and we see up here this tree of life. We only hear about it one other time in the entire Bible, and that's one little verse in uh, Proverbs. But otherwise, it's the beginning and the end, these bookends. And why is it there? And what does it mean? I invite you to join me on this journey, fasten your seatbelts. I invite you to look at your bulletin inside bottom right. We have printed there a couple verses of Genesis. We hear of being in the garden with God. That's our home. The Greek word for garden, paradise. In Genesis 2 verse 8, we hear that the Lord God planted the garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man that he formed. Eve will soon arrive. And then verse 9. Out of the garden, the Lord God made grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. Think of the trees in Black Forest. Think of the trees of an orchard, apple and peach and plum, apricot, shade trees, oak trees, all kinds of trees God made to grow. And then we hear the first reference to the tree of life. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and then a second tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now this tree of life, what would you think it signifies? Obviously it stands for life itself, even life eternal, life forever. But the tree represents more than the length of days, the quantity of time. It also speaks of the quality of life. But it isn't simply a heart beating or a movement, but rather it is life with the one who has made us his children. Eternal life becomes life with the Lord, with one another, but always in the context of his love and care. God made us, God protects us, God provides for us. When you think of the word life, think of how Jewish people make a toast. Do you remember what they say? L'chaim. What does it mean? To life. And it's more than simply physical life. L'chaim is life and happiness, wholeness, fullness, peace. It's a marvelously rich Hebrew word, and that's the word that is used here. The tree of Chaim, life.
Jesus will later say, and what is eternal life? That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Life centers around our relationship with the Lord and then with one another. The tree of life is to know God, to know his care, and know that he is our refuge in our very home. That's the tree of life. There's also another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Later, we hear that Adam and Eve are not to eat of this second tree. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of it, you will die, says the Lord. It can be confusing to us. How could it be bad to have knowledge? We have schools, we have books, we have podcasts. There's many ways for us to gain knowledge. And yet this tree is not simply a handbook for decision making. The Lord is saying to Adam and Eve, do not touch, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For knowledge isn't simply here. Knowledge for the Hebrew person is experience. It is to know intimately. It is to know by life what it means, good or evil. Again, the Hebrew word for evil isn't something simply in our heads, but rather it is, it is injury, harm, misery, despair. The Lord says, eat of the tree of life. There is peace and health and care and security. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is sickness and distress. As I mentioned to confirmation students as we talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do you really want to know what it is so hungry that you don't know where your next meal is coming from? Do you really want to know abuse or addiction? Do you really want to know despair? And the Lord is saying, you don't. So don't eat of that tree. It's like the parent who says to the child, don't touch the stove, it's hot. But of course, when such a choice is put before us, and when someone says no, what do we tend to do? We tend to do it. The tree is beautiful. The fruit looks like it's tasty. So they eat the fruit, they step out from under the Lord's care and protection. And now they, their eyes are open, they recognize, they know that they are naked. And who do they hide from? Number one, they hide from each other because they realize they're naked and they sew what? Fig leaves together. They hide from each other. They hear the sound of the Lord walking in the garden and where do they hide now? Behind the bushes and the trees. The Lord calls out, where are you? And Adam says, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat of? Adam could say what? Yes, I'm sorry, please forgive me. But what he says is, the woman you gave me made me eat. The Lord says to her, what is this that you have done? She could say what? I'm sorry I ate of the trees, please forgive me. But she points to the snake and says, there's the problem. And so now Adam and Eve, after eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in fact their eyes have been opened, are now separated from God, separated from each other, and even hiding from their own selves as they try to blame everybody else.
it's really not so different than you and I. I was talking with someone yesterday and I mentioned why has it been hard to pray? And he says, well, I suppose I just don't feel worthy. And so I don't. Separated from God. Why is it hard for us to acknowledge our wrong with one another? It forces us to realize that we're vulnerable. We'd rather not. And so then we hide, we separate, we're alienated from each other. And even ourselves as we try to seek the blame on somebody else rather than acknowledging our own misgivings. Think only how difficult it was sometimes at home during COVID. Do you love the people that you live with? My guess is yes. And yet, too much time together and stresses forces us apart. Adam and Eve's story is not simply something of long ago. But it's our story. It's our situation. Like them, we are alienated and separated from God, separated from each other, and even our own selves. It's the human predicament. But now we look deeper too. God still cares. Look at the bottom right of your bulletin again and that um, reading. In Genesis 3, the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. Adam and Eve are afraid. They're embarrassed. They think they need to cover up. And so because of their need, because of their perceived need, now God even joins them and says, let me give you something that will last. And yet in order to do so for the first time, an animal is killed so that the skin can be used for their clothes. We will hear more of that later. The next part is critical. Verse 22, the Lord says, See, the humans have become like us, knowing good and evil, experiencing good and evil. And now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and live forever. And therefore God sent them forth from the garden to till the ground from which they were taken. So why does God send them out of the garden? Is it to punish them? Often we think so. But if we look carefully, it's not for punishment. It's for protection. If they reach out and eat of the tree of life now, they will live forever, but they will forever be separated from each other, from God, and from them very selves. Eternally alone, always hiding, always far from home. So God protects them. He guards that tree of life with the cherubim and the flaming sword to keep from, from the greatest danger, which is living life forever alone. And thus begins God's great loving work of bringing us back, back home to himself. The rest of the Bible is this whole story and how God does it. It starts with Adam, excuse me, with Abraham and Sarah. He blesses them and then says, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Through them, somehow, all will come to know the Lord and come home to him. The couple has children. They have a family. The family becomes a nation. The nation ends up in Egypt as slaves. And God uses Moses to free them so that that nation now can bless others, all the families of the earth. Moses, years later, as the people stand at the entrance of the promised land, 
will invite the people with the same question that Adam and Eve had. I set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. And Moses says, choose life. Eat from this tree, not this tree. Later, King Saul and David and Solomon, under their leadership, the people are called to serve one another and be witnesses to God's goodness for all. But often, like us, they tend to serve themselves rather than others. Later, the prophets remind the people it is their purpose to be the light of the world, to point others to the Lord. But like us, they get busy and they find themselves doing many other things and they forget what they are called to do. Then through the prophets, we begin to hear what God is planning to do and how he will bring us back home to himself. Isaiah says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And out of this Hebrew people, we hear that one would come to rescue us, rescue us from ourselves. Isaiah says, All we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. I'll eat what I want. I'll experience what I want. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He would become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Apostle Peter will put it this way. He himself bore our sins in his body. Where? He says, on the tree on the tree, the cross. And now the tree becomes the cross. A Paul will say, he forgave our sins, erasing them, nailing them to that cross, rescuing us from the present darkness. The tree of death, the cross, now seems to become the tree that gives life. And now the cross the tree stands empty because Jesus, raised from the dead, now promises, I will be with you always. I am your Emmanuel, and I will draw all people to myself. Going all the way back, remembering the promise to Abraham, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. The story which started in the second chapter of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, now ends in the last book of the Bible, its last chapter, Revelation. And we hear in chapter 21, Behold, the home of God is among his people. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The new city, Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God. There is no temple there. Why? Because its temple is the Lord God Almighty. And the Lamb is who? It's none other than Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in that vision, John sees a river of the water of life flowing from God's throne and from the throne of the Lamb, through the middle of the city. And then there it is, the tree of life on either side of the river, its leaves and its fruit for the healing of the nations. The tree exists for the healing, not just you and I, but for all the families of the earth. What is this tree? It's the saving cross of Jesus. What is this tree of life? It's the tree on which Jesus gave his life so that we might live. 
This tree of life is a picture of God's own self-sacrificing love for us. The instrument he used to bring us all back to him on that long road home. The tree of life at the beginning of the Bible. Now we hear the tree of life at the end. The promise of life with the one who created us, who loves us, who wants to protect and provide for us, to keep us from evil. The very saving cross of Jesus. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. Come and gather beneath the tree of life, root of wisdom, branch of peace, fruit of healing and release. Come and gather beneath the tree of life. We sing. I invite you to turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 105. As we review 
God's big story from beginning to end, we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, it looks like you never give up. It was us, each of us, in that story way back of Adam and Eve. It's not good enough to simply say we wish they would have made different choices, for in many ways it is us in that story. You put before us a choice of life and death, of goodness and evil, of care and of loneliness. And often we choose the latter. Lord, throughout the whole history of Scripture, you have been working to bring us back, calling, inviting, and then finally providing the way, your Son, Jesus Christ on that tree of the cross. Lord, thank you for never giving up on us, but pursuing us, inviting us, calling us back, all through that tree of life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, continue to pour your life into us. Where we are wrong, correct us. Where we are lost, bring us back. Where we are hiding, oh, ask the same questions. Where are you? Like a good parent says to a child. Where we are right, strengthen us. Continue to open our ears and our hearts to your call. That we, more and more, might know you and experience home. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our broken world, where hunger and abuse and addiction and war rage. Lord, you would have something far better for us. We pray for your mercy, that leaders would make good decisions, people would reconcile, and we might hear your call to be light, servants, and witnesses for you. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for this weekend, for the snow and the coming rains. Thank you for hearing our prayers in our drought. Thank you for giving us relief, goodness for the soil, safety from the fires. Be with those who continue to fight them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Didi, our missionary to the Congo, and his wife, Serafina. Bless them and encourage them as they spend some time in the United States. Continue to rest your hand of healing upon Serafina. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for Diana, Lynn, Lydia, Sadie, Jane, Haldi, Electa, Dave and Tom, Jan, Duane, 
Josh, and for all those we pray for silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, O Lord, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace with one another. The offering prayer is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. Give our thanks and praise. 
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. He is the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy, eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for your grace shown to your people of every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets. And at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. The body of Christ broken for you. As you come to the table, form two lines. As you take a glass, I invite you to kneel or stand. When you are finished, please put your glass in the basket and return to your seat. Please be seated. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Olam upon his throne. A cover heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side. Rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but down would bend their burning eyes at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of Peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Diana, way to get it right.